Good morning. I'm George Willey. Welcome to The Other Side. In this program, we interview interesting people who have had an influence on the world, a country, or just in their communities. We first explore their life as they live it now, and then ask them to consider positions that may be contrary to theirs. This gives rise to an authentic discussion without the acrimony caused by talk show dramas. Today we have in our studios Sunil Thakkar. Sunil is the host of a widely popular radio show in Houston called Masala Radio. He's a radio host, a well-known comedian who has appeared both in India and in the United States in several TV shows and wrote and acted in a successful movie filmed right here in Houston and continues to be Mr. Entertainment in the Houston South Asian community. Let's get into this mischievous mind. <laughs> Sunil, welcome. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for having me here. Well, first, let's see. Now, what, what, what brought you to Houston and how, how did you end up here? You know, so when I was growing up, my brother is the first one that moved to Houston. And I always wanted, uh, you know, he would tell me stories and he would send me pictures, car shows. And he'd send me pictures of um, Lincolns and Fords and, you know, my fascination for large cars, mm -hmm. primarily. So you always loved cars. I loved cars. Yes. I, lo I love cars. Yes. All kinds of cars, small cars, large cars. I'm just into cars, and uh, and that's where my fascination Including grew. Including the taxi that you saw. Uh, <laughs> the only taxi in the world outside of India, we have it here in Houston. Right. It's a little black and yellow taxi with a meter. So my fascination with cars, just from his pictures that he would send me, he didn't really come back to India so often. Mm -hmm. He was hard working here in the U.S. He's an engineer, was in Detroit. And then he worked for Lummus and Bechtel and a bunch of these companies. And he would come every few years. He would bring me uh, those toy cars, uh -huh. you know. And I... So you, just the two of you in the family? And Too my much. sister. And you have a sister. Me and my brother. Okay. So my sister is 21 years older than me. My brother is 20 years older than me. And then we got a so big... So you are the baby boy. ...gap uh -huh. where my mom is like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> you know. Okay. So, so my brother was... My sister was married before I was born. Okay. She had a baby before I was born. So your your nephew so is. So my so my niece. Yes, oh, your is niece. older. Yeah. Yes. Than than me. It's not that unusual <laughs> in, in 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 our part of the world. But yeah. yeah. Okay. So you know, just all my life, I want to come to the U.S. I why I want to go to America. I want to go to America. I want to do this and that. And I uh, I was also into entertainment. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up in Bombay, you want to be. Everybody wants to do Bollywood. Right, so right. So I grew up, you know, I mean, we would play. It's an obsession. I mean, you know, in India, the, the, the Bollywood, you know, everybody expresses that in some way or the other. Growing up, especially in Mumbai. Yes. You know, if you're born and raised in Mumbai. Yes. You know, that's a capital of Bollywood. Every kid thinks yeah. he's right. a hero. Right. So we'd play, you know, guns in our building. And all the other kids would go bang, bang, bang. I would go, dishkiyo, dishkiyo, dishkiyo. <laughs> so I was a little over the top. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be a, uh, an actor. When I told that to my mom, I said, Mom, you know, growing up, I want to do two things. I want to go to America, I want to be an actor. She goes, pick one of those two. <laughs> you can't do both. <laughs> what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to be an actor. And one tight slap she gave me. And that's how my jaw is a little crooked. You see, it's a little crooked. And that's, she did not want me to do any of that. She, um, uh, you know, single mom, my father passed away. I see. Uh, and raising this little kid who was... Uh, so how, know, how young were you when you were dead? So my father passed away two months before I was born. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, so she raised me. So my mom is my mom and my dad. And then when I was born, my sister was married. And my brother, when I was two, is when he came to the U.S. So it was... Mom was your entire world. My, my world is my mom. And she kept me... She was very protective. Mm -hmm. You know, she didn't want me to go outside of Matunga which is my area that I lived in. You can't go, you know, if I want to wa watch a movie, it has to be in a theater in Matunga. I see. I couldn't go out too far. Two mile was like my distance. Um, and, you know, then when I graduated high school, she's like, I think now you should go to America to study. And I'm like, I, you know, I've never really been that far away from her. 
You know? But she was ready, for, ready to let you go. But she was ready to let me go. Because she realized that there was something that you had to do for your future. Yeah. Right? yeah. And she saw that my brother made progress. Yes. And she saw that I was, uh, I was an average kid. In education, I was an average kid. Nothing special. But also, I understand that you had some uh, stuttering uh, issue when you were growing up. How in the world is that possible? <laughs> you know, I, um, uh, it just started when I was four. And it stuck. I don't know how it started. My mom took me to all these hospitals, and I remember. And so it was a later onset. You, were, you didn't have the stuttering before you were four. No, I started okay. at four when I was four. Okay. So I knew it wasn't anything physical. Yes. It was something with the mind. Right. And mom tried, and it, would, and, it, and it was bad. And there were some words, T, J, S. I couldn't even, my, my real name was Sunil. Uh -huh. And she changed, she gave me a nickname, Rajesh. So that you could uh, I couldn't even say it. it would be I <laughs> <laughs> it takes a while to get Sunil. it out. Yeah. And sometimes if I think about it, mm. I still stutter. You'll say that, yeah, of course. When yeah, I think about yeah, it. Yeah. But, um, so she changed my name, my nickname to Rajesh. Mm -hmm. so everybody called me Rajesh. Nobody knew me as Sunil. So, so how did you get out of it? I really think it was because I was, you know, it was maybe I was over, I was just, I was different. I was, I was insecure, mm -hmm. very insecure growing up. Um, and I don't know for what reason um, it stuck with me. The stuttering stuck for 14 years. It stuck with me. So you were almost 18 before you got over it. 17 is where it started. And what happened is I moved here when I was 17. Okay. So you were in the U.S. by you by the, by by the time you were 17. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I moved here when I was 17, and I think at the in my 18th year, mm -hmm. I grew tall. Um, my voice changed and I became a bit more confident. So you had a growing spurt later in life. Very late in life. I hit puberty late in life. Mm -hmm. I grew up late. Everything that's happened in my life just has come a little later. That's but it's okay. I just enjoy the process <laughs> right, more so. Right. But 18 is where it started to dissolve mm -hmm. my, my stuttering. And I think being in, being in this country and I think just a little free and being independent and having my growth spurt and being... So um, that gave you the confidence and you I didn't have to all ca carry that stuttering again. Huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're in good company. I mean, you know, Churchill was supposed to have stuttered. Uh, yeah. and, and, of course, uh, one of the history's greatest uh, uh, orators, Demosthenes, uh, was a stutterer. Oh, really? Uh, and, yeah. And, you know, that old King thing... King George. In, uh, King George was a star. Yeah. Of course, we saw, yeah, the... Uh, what an amazing uh, what movie. What an amazing movie. I love that movie. Then, uh, apparently... It was tough to watch that movie, though. Oh. It was tough to watch it because tough. I went... It is tough. Oh, through, for you. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So, so you got over it. I got over it, yeah. and uh, it comes back every now and then, mm -hmm. but I'm in complete control of it. Yeah. Like, I have but the no confidence. No one would believe that you ever started, Sunil. I My mean. family back home <laughs> wouldn't believe that I'm that you are like what you're now. <laughs> yeah. Because I look And different. a comedian, you go out in front of, I don't know, hundreds of people. You're on, on radio, that, you know, thousands of people listening. And then but thank God. Thank God I grew out of it because it was a tough phase for me. I couldn't speak on the phone. I was so conscious that if I had somebody in front of me, yes. I couldn't actually have a conversation on the phone. If I wanted to speak on the phone, I could only do it if there was nobody in front of me. So I think, you know, it was just something very, I don't know what a mental block it was. I don't know how it started. Uh, some say it's because of a dream you had, or some say if you were abused, and none of that, no, no, you know. It's happened to you, so. Um, so soon, now from well, God there. Is great. God is great to God is great to give me the opportunity to be able to speak, and I'm just so thankful. I'm so, so thankful. Well, we're all thankful. <laughs> uh, Sunil, um, so from that to entertainment, now how did that happen? How, how did you move from this reclusive kid suddenly in the limelight, jumped here, and you know, today in Houston and, and pretty much in the United States, you know, most folks from our community know S Sunil, Sunil Thakur, right? So how did that happen? You know, I always wanted to be an actor, mm -hmm. you know, growing up. Mm -hmm. So I had the dialogues down. Some of the dialogues that the actors would speak, I had them down. So I realized that if I had, if, 
if I had the dialogue down, I could do it without stuttering. Mm. Only if I practiced it and I had it down. Right. All about confidence. So when I came here, the first or second year that I was in U of H, um, and I was still not that social, but the president of ISA knew that I had some of these dialogues, so funny dialogues that Johnny Lever spoke and Keshto Mukherjee spoke and you know Amitabh, how Amitabh speaks, hey, apan tere ko kar dega. You know? <laughs> right. and, and so I had those down. Mm. And he saw that I had this talent and he's like, hey, do you want to do a little segment mm. um, you know, at the ISA show and just impersonate some film stars? It's Indian students show and you want to do it? And I'd never held a mic before. I'd never done, but he had, you know, encourage you, made it look like you, you could do it. Yeah, and I just kind of gone through my stuttering, so, you know, I mean, I could speak, so he's like, hey, maybe you should do it, and I was like, uh, I don't know, maybe I will, because I always wanted to do something. Right. And I, I said yes without really, you know, fully understanding that, man, I'm going to have to stand in front of the stage, I've never done that, and I'm shy, and I was shy growing up, I was a shy kid, very shy kid, very, very shy, up until this point, and then the show, uh, a week or two before the show, mm -hmm. somehow the MC uh, didn't work out. So this guy is like, okay, so you do the comedy, can you just introduce, uh, you know, the ISA officers, do your comedy in the middle, and at the end, do a little closing statement. Can you do that? So that was your first on stage uh, performance? First time. I'd never held a mic ever in my life. And, you know, so I worked hard. And I just worked hard two weeks, and I learned my lines and learned my lines. And, and when I went on stage for the first time, and I had the mic with me, and I did my funny dialogues, and the audience cracked up, is just, I don't know, I just felt like I could do this. I think I can do this. Hold that thought. We're going to take a break. We'll be back with Sunil Thakkar of Masala Radio. We invite you to visit one of our sponsors, Asia Society Texas Center in Houston's Museum District. See their latest exhibition, Drawn from Nature, for free until February 21st. Be sure to mention that you saw the ad on the other side. On the other side, we interview a variety of people and seek to examine their beliefs, their opinions, and their passions. Then we invite them to come with us to the other side and look at the antithesis of their views. What comes out is an in-depth conversation without the vitriol of the talk shows, but a cerebral engaging of ideas you will not find anywhere else. Come join us on alternate Saturdays at 8.30 a.m. on this channel. If you'd like to recommend a guest for the other side, contact us at the email address on the screen. Welcome back to the other side. We are in conversation with Sunil Thakkar, the man about town in Houston and the, and the host of Masala Radio, as they say it. Uh, Sunil, welcome back. Um, you know, obviously you had a very entertaining life in the United States. You've, you've, uh, uh, you went to U of H, you mm -hmm. had an engineering degree yeah, there. Yeah, mechanical engineering. And, uh, and then <laughs> talk about boring subjects. Huh? But then here you are, an entertainer, entertaining the world. Um, but I understand um, you also served in the military. Mm. Uh, that comes as a sort of a shock to a lot of people too. They don't kind of associate you with the military. Tell us about that. You know, when I came here, in fact, I had my dog tags here and I just had to put them away, but I, I always carry my dog tags with me. Mm -hmm. It's been 25 years and they always stay on with me. I've got two pairs, one pair I lost, and I'm very particular about my second pair. These are my dog tags. Yes, I and see. And I got them in uh, Fort Bliss, El Paso. Mm -hmm. And I got two sets and they're 25 years old. And one set I lost, um, and this is my, se my second set. And uh, very proud, very proud that I had amazing time in the army. Very tough. Yes. Basic training was very tough and made a man out of me. Yes. You know, basically, I didn't really have the funds to go to college. Mm -hmm. um, my brother said, uh, I went to college, I paid for my college. Mm -hmm. And rather than me paying for your college, I think you need to figure out how to pay for your college. That's just kind of, that's 
you know. That's the training. I mean, you know, the family has to, 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 you know, they helped you bringing you over here and then you had to pay your own way. So first semester, uh, I was going to school, 12 hour school, and I worked at Target, 12 hours. And then I worked at Pizza Inn about 30 hours. Um, tough days. Tough days. And I got a couple of C's, one F, I actually failed one class in my entire college, like one F. Uh -huh. At the end of the semester, I realized that I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to work and sustain and pay bills. And I was in a mall, and there was this kiosk where I joined the Army, and I had a green card. So, you know, I went there, I spoke to him. The Army is going to pay for basic training. The Army is going to pay um, for my college GI Bill. I come back from basic training with money, and I could I could use it for my, uh, you know, for my expenses. And Did it you seemed, serve in any combat? I didn't go to any combat. I was in the reserve. Six years, went to reserve, went to um, basic training Fort Bliss, and then my advanced AIT in Fort Leonard Wood. Um, I changed oil in Hummers. That's why I love Hummers and you could be called back anytime though. I if they call me, I'm well, willing what's, to go. What's the age limit where they, they can actually get you back? In you know, uh, they can really. I mean, uh, if they need to, they can call anybody that has been that has served. Even though you've, uh, you know, you don't serve anymore, they can call you back. And I'm sure you'll serve proudly again. If and I would love to go. And I would love to go. Although I'm not a proponent of using firearms and guns. I used, um, you know, I learned how to throw grenades and I learned the, uh, the rifle. Mm -hmm. I'm just not, uh, you know, somebody that wants to use. Well, that, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, it's not, to, not so much that you have the power, but not, not wanting to use it for purposes other than it is meant for. Yeah, and if I have to serve my country and if I have to use it to protect my country and I will do it. I will do it. So look, now from the militaristic days, you also had a sort of a spiritual awakening with, uh, with the meeting of one of yeah. your guru. Uh, talk us, tell us a little bit about that. You know, I was never really religious. Born Hindu, went to a Catholic school. My best friend was Parsi. So he took me to the Zoroastrian Fire Temple. Mm -hmm. um, coming here, uh, a very good friend of mine is Ismaili. So I'm, I'm sort of, um, I believe in everything. You know, I believe in, I believe in humanity, I believe so in karma. So universal religion. Yeah, and you know, karma, what you do, what you reap here, um, what you sow is what you reap. You reap, yes. And so that's what I believe in, and, and so the books and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not just so religious. But having spoken to Sadhguru and realizing that we're all connected in a way and God lives in all of us and we're just, you know, we're all children, one God. Uh, and there has to be a plan. This is such a beautiful world around me, you know. So I now feel the presence of something superior in everything in just in everything in in uh, so it was a pretty permanent influence on you it, it kind of affected the way you looked at the world it affected the way you treated people affected the way you related to people i didn't really think that i was that anybody was really watching me because i didn't i wasn't religious and you know i mean i don't really believe in god nobody's watching me i can do whatever i want we're just it's evolution this is just it's science it's evolution um but uh, having spoken to Sadhguru and having um, having gone through a yoga session with him, and it was a full day of yoga session and just reflecting, I never really reflected. I I'm not into meditation. I cannot sit still and meditate. You know, I can't even sit still here. I cannot sit still and just yoga is you sit still and you close your eyes and not let thoughts come to you and just let thoughts come and go. And I can do that for maybe five seconds. You know, like, <laughs> what's going on here, you know? I'm just, I could never do it. Well, you have a naughty mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but, but something about just kind of sitting and reflecting, it's the first time that I reflected. It's the first time that I realized that a few things that I'd done in my life 
you know, a few people that I've hurt, um, you know, it, it's I, I started to look at myself from a third, third party point of view, looking at me. You know, one of the things that you hear about yoga is that you, in that kind of a pose, you eventually get to this stillness, mm. this complete quietness where no thoughts, nothing else is in your head, it's, just, it's empty and that you are in this place where it's so still. And apparently in that place where you reach that stillness, that you connect with the universe. You connect with the universal power, that whatever that power is, that you eventually sort of connect. And then that apparently is the, the, the power of yoga. So one moment when we were all in this George Brown Convention Center, 2,000 people, and we're doing yoga for a while, and at first I just couldn't get into it and couldn't get into it. And, um, you know, Sadhguru is singing these hymns, and at some point, I don't know what happened, but I almost felt like my soul stepped out of my body, and I looked at everybody in a sea of people. And the issues that I think are such big issues, because they're my issues, all of a sudden seem to be insignificant because I was just one among so many people. Everybody has issues and everybody thinks I am the universe and it's my, my time and my worries and my the issues world, uh, revolves, revolves, revolves around you, right? Around right. you, and it always does. It has to, to a certain extent, yes. but I never stepped out of that. I never stepped so you out. So you had a kind of an out-of-body experience? I had experience. an out-of-body experience. I stepped out of my body and I looked at myself sitting down and I looked at everybody else and it just it just seemed like I really was I really was insignificant and and I wish I could feel it more often because I'm always caught up into you know my time and my this and my contract and you know why did he do this and why am I it's not as big a deal and it's the first time ever in my life that I felt that some of the things that I really ponder on and, and you know, worry about. Do you still keep in touch with Sadhguru? I do, okay. I do. So whenever he comes to the US, mm -hmm. whether it's Tennessee or Houston, I go to be a part of that mass. I don't know whether it was a fact that there were so many people doing it together. You know, Could I've tried mm -hmm. it again mm -hmm. on my own but I've never reached never that. never reached that stage. No, no, I've never had. But I know no, that I did you, once, and yeah. I and and I believe. Have you interviewed him on your radio show? I, yeah, I did. I did. I had. Uh, we actually did a video conference interview. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in India, and he was coming here for a, uh, a mass yoga. So I did a little. He was on the screen, and I was interviewing him, and. Uh, and it was, it was interesting, his words, the way he sings, the way he um, just kind of gets you and just eases your mind. And uh, something about him is divine. So from the sublime to the absurd, I'm going to take you to the other side. Um, <laughs> the other side. I love it. I like the other side. I've never, you know, I've never really been interviewed. I'm always interviewing. People, so I've never right, been right. interviewed. So it is slightly uncomfortable, but it's okay. I mean, you know, I'm enjoying it as a new experience. This well, is something I'm all about experiences in life. You're doing very well, so now. But, uh, you know, <clears throat> This world and and and, and India and and, and the, our regions, they're all. We spend a lot of time on time and money on entertainment, right? Are we overdoing it? Is it something that that the human species itself? You know, we are we are we are constantly stimulated, one way or the other. Now with the with the burst of technology, I mean, every piece of technology eventually tries to entertain you. Um, is, are we are we overdoing this? Are we? Uh, um, is, is it is it something that that's a saturation point that we've reached that somehow it's beginning to affect who we are? Uh, is it affecting our relationships? You know, these are some of the fears that people people express. What are your thoughts? You're in the middle of the entertainment industry. What do you think that that that's going on? I think we're on the path of no return. Mm -hmm. And we and everything has to be entertaining now. 
everything. Religion has to be entertaining. Right. Politics yes. has to be entertaining. As we can see now uh, with Mr. Trump. If you yeah. can entertain, mm -hmm. you win. If you can entertain in anything, religion, politics, radio, law, it doesn't matter. Now the lines between just, you know, previously you were an actor, you were an entertainer, and then you were a professional doing your services. Now everything is merged. Real estate agents now have to entertain. You yes. go and you make these nice spiffy videos, and you're in the, I'm going to sell your house for you, and I'm going to uh, do this. And it's about, it's about how you can capture well, the mind. Well, well, is it that maybe that we have finally figured out that the human being is a creature of, of uh, entertainment, and, and perhaps we have finally tapped that to the point that you know, we can sell, we can not only sell, I mean, even education. You know, we, we, we use entertainment, and that's okay. I mean, if people are learning, why not? Yeah, uh, it is okay, and it's continue. I think it's going to get deeper and deeper, and, and there's no return. You have to now, you cannot avoid it. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to be in it. You have to entertain no matter what you do. Um, and uh, at some point in time, I, I believe we're going to have chips in our in our head mm -hmm. instead of phones and it's going to be constant. Now, how do you step out of it? I don't know. So, no, I think we are out of time. So, you, you want to plug in uh, uh, your, your holy uh, event that's coming on? Yeah, that's why I've got this green shirt is because we do something called a uh, green holy. And holy is a festival of colors and festival of love. It started thousands of years ago when Lord Krishna, he was, uh, he was a god, but he was also a prince. He was in love with this little kid, uh, Radha, who was a daughter of a shepherd. Uh, and they were kids. And just so that they wouldn't be, people wouldn't recognize them, his mom is like, use this color, put it on, you, on yourself, put it on her, so nobody knows who you guys are. Uh, and that's how. So that's how it started. That's, that's, the, how, that's the story holy, behind Holy, yeah. I see. So he colored his face, he colored her face, and that gave birth to their love. Uh, and it gave birth to Holi. And people celebrate Holi in March as uh, a festival of togetherness. Friends and families go out in India and they put color on, on their friends and families just to show that you know, they care for you and they love you. And uh, so that's what we do here. We celebrate Holi in a big way. March 26th at the Houston Farm and Ranch, we'll have music, we'll have live concert, we'll have plenty of color to, to throw. Uh, and uh, the website is HoustonHoly.com, H-O-L-I, HoustonHoly.com. <clears throat> Everybody's invited, and thank you for sponsoring. Absolutely, really. and uh, Sunil, thank you for coming. It was a colorful uh, <laughs> interview. So uh, uh, we've been talking to Sunil Thakur. Uh, join us again on the other side. <laughs>